Well, greetings, amazing students. Welcome back to lecture two of HIPSI two uh, this semester. So wanted to say thank you so much for tuning into the first lecture and I'm excited to bring you the content for today's lecture. Uh, the focus of today's lecture, we're gonna be discussing institutionalized racism. And I know that many of us, when we hear the term institutionalized racism, when we just hear racism, when we hear words like prejudice or bigotry or discrimination, um, we can have a tendency to sort of clam up and to get nervous, right? Um, I'm going to recognize, right, first off, that I understand that it's difficult at times to talk about topics like institutionalized racism. There's a lot of reasons why and we're gonna examine some of those very reasons uh, today. Um, but from a, a social worker lens, right, um, it's essential to be able to talk about things like institutionalized racism and discrimination and prejudice, things like that, um, because we spend our careers uh, attempting to dismantle um, oppressive systems that exist in our society. We spend our careers serving those who are individuals, who are bearing the weight of systemic oppression in the society. Many of us, when we signed up for an MSW program, um, stated that some of the social problems that you are interested in fixing come as a direct result of you experiencing institutionalized racism or bigotry or discrimination uh, to some degree in your life as well, right? And so, we uh, owe it to ourselves, to our clients, to our practice, um, to discuss these things, even if they're difficult, so that we can be the best social workers we can be, um, to, to become aware, right, woke, if you will, of some of the social issues that we're facing, as well as how we can dismantle them, right? So the focus of today's presentation will be institutionalized racism. I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the PowerPoint for today. Now, our discussion around this topic, right? Um, I'm gonna do things a little a little different some, sometimes how we may have approached this in the past. As you know, I like to use media. As you know, I like to use sound clips and poetry and things like that to highlight, right? Emulate the discussion um, to bring it to a new understanding, another way of looking at an issue. I'm gonna do some of that today, right? But I wanna start with a disclaimer before we start the lesson. I said that many of you might be nervous about talking about this issue, even though we're going to talk about it later, you may just feel nervous about diving in um, to this topic. I just want to say, if you're feeling like it's a, a little, uh, the content for today is a little triggering, um, some of the content that I'm going to share with you today may be difficult to watch and hear. I'm going to be completely honest with you with that. I'll give you a heads up before that happens. Um, you may feel overwhelmed during the lesson. I want you to know that that's okay. It's okay to take a break. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. You may always set an appointment with me after the lesson. If you feel like you wanna process some of it, we can connect, okay? Uh, what I, what I wanna ask you to do is if at any point during the lesson, I'm moving through the content and it gets heavy for you, uh, please just go ahead and pause and step away, right? But can you do me a favor? And I'm gonna ask if you could please do this. Can you please commit to returning to the lesson and coming back and not, not just ending it? And the reason for that is because I'm gonna ask us to respect the fact that none of the content that I'm bringing you today is imaginary or fictional, right? None of this has been made up. None of it is Hollywood. It's not embellished. This, uh, the content I'm bringing you are the experiences of everyday people uh, people that have lived their lives facing these experiences every single day and still live with them to this day. So for that reason, when it's a matter of our lives being impacted, we don't get to push pause on our life, right? Um, for that reason, I'm asking that it's okay to honor your feelings and feel overwhelmed and take care of yourself, but please return back to the lesson, okay? Um, when we get into this, you know, even though we're doing this asynchronously for this lesson, there will be a time, right, where we can talk about these issues together. And <clears throat> in that, I always encourage students to come from the approach people, just in general, to seek to understand, right, before we are pushing someone um, to understand us, we should understand them. I want us to choose to listen and to love, as opposed to yell and to blame to start and remember to enter our conversations with empathy, right? And as we know from our centering exercises that we do, 
We believe that Christ is present in every single moment of our lives, every single discussion, everything that we do. And so I've found that over the years, talking about these issues, although difficult, is not impossible. Um, because for me personally, I believe Christ is with me through all of these conversations, including this lesson today. So things are going to be okay. Take a deep breath, right? And, and it's going to be fine, right? So here's what I would like to do. I'd like to start with a story, if you will, to introduce the notion of institutionalized racism um, and how we're going to talk about it. And I'd like to tell you a story about an elephant and a giraffe. Okay, and that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to share my screen again. All right. And um, I just want to make sure I've queued it up properly here. Okay. Oh, sorry. Stop sharing again. My bad. Let me share this one more time with you. And if I can't get this to work, uh, I've got a, a workaround to that. So fear not, right? <laughs> so let me share the screen again. Uh, and we'll work with this on the story. Okay. I think what we're going to do, screen sharing is paused. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna bring the story up and you can read along with me, all right, as we talk about the story of the elephant and the giraffe and we'll work it that way, all right? So here's the story of the elephant and giraffe. And like any good story, we need to start with a once upon a time, right? So let's talk about that. This is the, the story of the elephant and giraffe uh, by Roosevelt Thomas. Once upon a time, right, in a small community just outside of Riverside, right, California, there were a family of giraffes. They had worked hard to build themselves a new house with all of their needs in mind. They were soaring ceilings and tall doorways, high windows with lots of light and narrow hallways that conserved space. It was such a wonderful house that it won the National Giraffe Home of the Year Award. One day, the head giraffe was working in his new basement wood shop when he looked out the window and saw someone familiar. It was an elephant that he had worked on the local parent teacher association committee with. Giraffe remembered that the elephant was a woodworker and an exciting thought occurred to him. Maybe elephant would like to work on some projects with me. Giraffe stuck his head out the window and invited the elephant in. Come on in elephant, right? The elephant was delighted. He had liked working with the giraffe and thought that this would be the perfect way to get him to know him better. He walked up to the basement door and waited for giraffe to open it. Giraffe opened the door, greeted elephant, but then the two animals were faced with a problem. Elephant could get his head through the door, but he cannot go further because the door was too narrow. Giraffe wasn't worried. He quickly explained to the elephant that the door was expandable in order to accommodate woodworking projects and equipment. With a pop of a bolt and a slip of a panel, Elephant was able to get through the door. The two acquaintances were happily exchanging woodworking stories when the phone rang. Giraffe saw that it was his boss and told Elephant he needed to take a call. He told the Elephant to make himself at home and he went upstairs to his office apologizing that it might take a few minutes. Elephant decided to take a look around the workroom, saw a half finished project in the far corner and decided to take a look at it. As he walked through the doorway to get to the far side, he heard an ominous sound and his back, his back end crunched up against the sides of the door frame. He backed out. He decided to join the giraffe upstairs, but as he tried to walk upstairs, the stairs began to crack. He jumped off and hit the wall and made a huge dent in the drywall. He sat there disheveled and dismayed until giraffe came back down the stairs. Giraffe was surprised and explained, what on earth is going on? Elephant replied, looking slightly ashamed, I was trying to make myself at home. Giraffe looked around at the workshop and then smiled. I see what's going on here, he said. The doorway is too narrow for you, your large back end. We didn't make you smaller. There's an aerobic studio in our neighborhood. If you'd like to take some classes, we could get you down to size. Elephant looked like he wanted to shrink into the very wall that he had dented a few minutes earlier. He said quietly, maybe. Giraffe continued, and the stairs are obviously too weak to carry your weight, so if you go to ballet classes at night, I'm sure we can get you to a point where you are lighter on your feet. Can you do those things? It would be great if you could, because it would be nice for us to work together. Perhaps, said the elephant, but to tell you the truth, I'm not sure a house is designed for a giraffe would ever really work for an elephant. 
unless there were some major changes. So this is the story of the giraffe and the elephant. And what I'd like us to focus on for a second here, and let me bring up my, my PowerPoint slides, slide deck here, right? Obviously we know if we examine the story from a lens of institutionalized racism that the giraffe right, represents the status quo, the dominant group in society. And the elephant represents those that are marginalized in our society. If we look at this from a factor of race, as a history in the United States, what this would look like is the draft would represent descendants, individuals, right, of European culture who colonized the United States, who later gathered the definition of white um, as a social construct of race. And the elephants would represent people of color, more specifically African Americans in this country, um, or individuals who identify as black or African American in this country. And this story really eloquently and innocently speaks to, but, but in a real fashion, the experiences of institutionalized racism that exist in our society, right? The two wanna hang out, the two aren't opposed to one another, they weren't fighting, in fact, they wanted to work on a project. One invited the one over to his house, right? Elephant sat in the giraffe's living room they shared common interests. They were having a hospitable conversation. They both had jobs, right? But something changed, right? This house, this neighborhood, this society was built for giraffes. Therefore, you're different. And I like you and I care about you and I wanna be your friend, but I need you to do a few things for me first, right? If you only were a certain size, if you only looked a certain way, if you only didn't talk, I mean, you'll hear this a lot, is loud, right? If you weren't in the wrong place at the wrong time, if you hadn't drawn attention to yourself, if you hadn't spoken back to the police, right? Well, you know, if you hadn't gone to jail that one time, maybe it would be easier to find a job. You know, all of these comments are made, remember what we refer to as microaggressions on a daily basis that don't just represent the interactions between two individuals, they feed into a much larger network, a system of oppression that exists on a daily basis. If you notice here, the two were interacting on a reality that was beyond themselves. Giraffe wasn't the only giraffe that had built a giraffe house, right? Giraffe had a neighborhood of houses that were only built for giraffes. And so what happens, an elephant comes along and an elephant suddenly is not only different from one person, it's different from an entire community, right? So this is just a notion, a segue, right? That I'd like to lead us into discussing institutionalized racism. Now, you heard me say in the previous slide, I made a delineation between what I said was African-American and black. I would like to, before we go into the lesson, go ahead and clarify the usage of these terms, just so that you're on the same page when you understand how I'm using the terms and why, okay? so. So you may hear some individuals, right, refer to themselves as African-American or Black. Now, many of you may also know that I'm multiracial, right? So I come from a blend of different races, some of that being Latino or Latinx, some of that being Filipino and Native American, and others of that being Creole in particular. So already a blend of African-American. So let me give you an example of the terminology using myself, right? So African-American, that term refers to an individual of American ethnicity who shares partial, partial ancestry of African origin, okay? So many times an individual then may say, well, my ancestors are from Africa, okay? Or we're from Africa and I'm here now. So I consider myself to be African-American, okay? And that's, that's fine because they're saying that. Now, black is a term, uh, a general term that includes individuals of African descent, but also includes indigenous Africans, African-Americans, and individuals from the Caribbean and immigrants, regardless of their ethnicity, okay? So here's what's important to understand. It's not just necessarily, includes ethnicity and not just, um, uh, Africa. Okay. So ethnicity can be shared customs, um, um, either languages, religion, things like that that may categorize. So here's important to understand across the globe, there are individuals that may have features that represent that of a sort of African-American features, but they don't come 
from Africa necessarily. So some indigenous groups, depending on where you are and where you are around the globe, okay, may have similar features, but that doesn't mean they're from Africa. So individuals may say, well, I may choose to identify as black rather than African-American, particularly because in my example, for example, if, if you were to ask some of my family members, are we black or African-American? Some of my family may say African-American, others may say black. And they may say that they're black because specifically we cannot trace our ancestral roots back all right, to Africa. We, we know that some of my family have features, right? S physical attributes that resemble that, um, but we don't know for sure where our ancestors came from on that side of the family. So we don't claim to be African because we can't say 100% that we are, if that makes sense. So you're gonna hear me using this term. Now, what's important to understand though is that individuals may have preferences uh, in terms of being called African-American or black, okay? And so just because you're applying this definition doesn't mean that everyone is necessarily gonna feel the same about it. Later, when we have uh, lessons on other topics, I'll distinguish the terminology, okay? Now, oftentimes we fear talking about racism. We get nervous about these topics because no one likes being called a racist, right? We fear being told that we are a bad person. Racist, if someone calls us a racist in this country, uh, it's like being told that we are morally right, wrong, we are immoral, that we can even be a hypocrite because what we're doing is in contrast to our values and things that we hold close to our heart. And people will outright hate us, right? If we outwardly proclaim that we are a racist. Racism in this country has become a very um, heated word um, and is considered a personal attack on our, on, um, our personality, on our value system, on us as people, if someone were to call us a racist. And for this reason, then what happens is, is that it makes it difficult in this country to really talk openly and honestly about racism. Let me ask you a question then. What do you think a racist looks like? For a quick second, maybe just close your eyes and picture in your head, when I say that I'm talking about racists, okay? What does a racist look like? Well, let's move on to the next slide here. Oftentimes, when we talk about what does a racist look like, we have this image that's going on in our head. When we picture the marches, we picture things like the Ku Klux Klan and the hoods and the outfits. We picture the salutes, right, to Heil Hitler and the torches and all of this going on. This is our image of racism. And it would be wrong to say that this image of racism isn't true because obviously it is, right? These marches take place. All of this takes place on a daily basis. These images exist in our society because they have been used in our history to represent racism, right? But if we stop here with our definition of what a racist is, if we stop here and say that this is the only form of racism as social workers, as, as human beings, we would be doing ourselves a disservice. Let me explain why. The images that exist here on the screen refer to a binary understanding of racism. Binary meaning two, right? By two ways. This image that we have here fails to address the complexity, the macro all right, approach to racism that is taken on a daily basis. This here is a snapshot of individuals who have a racist ideology. This does not necessarily capture the depth or complexity of the systems that are working in the background to generate this large group of individuals to motivate them uh, for this racist ideology. Let me explain this for a second. In our country, when we think of racism, we think of racist as bad and non-racist as good, binary, two different things. Oftentimes what runs through our heads when we think of racism or a racist is ignorant. Words like bigoted, prejudiced, mean-spirited. We picture even an age group in there, a demographic of being old. And we also regionalize it and say that racism primarily comes from the South. That's in the deep South. That's where racism lies. We often forget though, that racism, segregation, discrimination existed to the same extent out here in California. California is often painted as this liberal bubble 
uh, where somehow racism has just eroded away and everyone just gets along. And that's absolutely not the case, nor is it the history of our country. I would encourage us to look at, you know, once COVID is done and kids are going back to school and they're walking home from school, watch the groups of kids that walk home from school. We may have diversity in California, but segregation still exists. You may see African-American children, Latino children, Asian children, white children walking home from school, but look at who they're walking with, right? Diversity, yet segregated. We often think in a binary understanding of racism that if you're not racist, well, that's good, right? You, you must be progressive, you must be educated, you must be open-minded, you must be well-intentioned, young, and maybe, probably, you're from the North or you're from the West Coast, right? Or as they've said that, you know, many times you're from the left coast. What's important to understand though is that this is a failed understanding of racism, right? Many times, I have and other people have experienced working with individuals who carry a racist ideology, maybe one of white supremacy, who are young. Right? They're from the North, or maybe they're even from California. Um, they're definitely educated right? and uh, they have a great vocabulary and they're charming and they're well-dressed. Right? Racism takes forms in many different ways. And so we have to understand that while this certainly is an image of what a racist could look like. It's not the only image. And if this is our understanding of racism, we have to begin to walk away from the fact that maybe the definition we've believed and started to become accustomed to of racism is a little outdated. It doesn't serve its purpose anymore. As social workers then, we have to consider when looking at macro issues like institutionalized racism, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. First, who benefits from this social norm or practice? When we talk about racism, well, and it's institutionalized, then that means that there's a system to benefit from it. So who's benefiting, right, from this practice? Who is subjugated as a result of this social norm or practice? In other words, who is oppressed as a result of it? Which social systems contribute to the social problem, right? What is my relationship to those systems, right? Um, this is where I have relatives that are law enforcement, right? And I believe that we do need law enforcement. I love my relatives at the same time. It would be painful for me to consider like, and even think, right? In the same sentence that some of my coworkers, could my, could my, I'm sorry, could my family, right? Being law enforcement also be racist, right? That's a scary thought for a lot of us to consider. But let me turn the question on myself. Could I be racist, right? I'm educated, I'm a social worker, right? I'm a human being. I'm gonna offer you a, a different definition of racism, which I would like you to consider that the answer can be yes for all of the questions I just posed to you. What is my relationship to the systems I'm interacting with? What am I doing to contribute to the disruption or dismantling of these oppressive practices? We talked about Pepsi, right? In the first, and then we used that Nike commercial in the first lecture. We talked about these large companies benefiting off of a message of inclusion Right, but not doing anything to dismantle the systems that existed, the institutionalized racism that existed on a daily basis. And finally, the hard question to ask ourselves is, if I am doing something right, to dismantle these oppressive systems, not just to challenge individual experiences, that's important, but to dismantle the systems, am I doing enough? That's a tough question to ask. So why is it hard to talk about racism, right? Well. Uh, it's easy for us to believe that our experiences are everyone's experiences. Some people see race, others don't. We are taught from a young age that everyone is the same, right? Some of us. It's uncomfortable at times to sit in the discomfort of seeing race, right? When we draw this to the surface, we're looking at this and saying, oh, this is uncomfortable. We have been taught to believe racism looks a certain way, right? Like those images that I shared and engaging in a practice that is racist is often correlated in our society to an individual being a racist, which leads to condemnation, socially, economically, spiritually, right? You become the pariah, right? And so one definition of racism is a person who holds conscious dislike of people uh, uh, because of their race. That's the definition we've been playing with, right? Now, I can almost picture it that if we were sitting in class right now, 
right? This is where I can pick up on the body language that's going on. And some of you may be doing this right now as you're watching this in your chairs and you're thinking, oh gosh, Dr. Mexico, right? I am so nervous right now. And you may be feeling like I am right now, right? Well, I want you to just relax, right? We're having a conversation about this. Let's stop for a second and recognize that the discomfort that we're sitting in is normal and it's okay. Um, but let's also give ourselves the courage and the strength to press on with the conversation. I'm going to ask us to look at racism differently now, right? And this is a, a definition according to Robin uh, D'Angelo, who writes the book White Fragility, uh, which is an amazing book that I would encourage you to check out, right? First off, let's recognize something in order to look at racism, the definition differently. Race and ethnicity are socially constructed. Sociologists, anthropologists have examined this, verified this over years of work and research to determine that things like race, things like ethnicity, things like gender, for example, are social constructs. We build them in our minds. We assign race, okay, uh, in order to understand. In fact, the term white didn't always exist as a, uh, a race until post-colonialism in this country, when there had to be a delineation in how we treated people who were, were white, both rich and poor, and how we treated people of color, Native Americans, uh, Africans, okay, who were uh, being transported, stolen, and brought here to the United States, as well as other immigrant populations. And so we had to develop a term uh, to include everyone that looks similar that we wanted to include in our circles of privilege. This is where the notion of the term white came from, okay? Racism, its tactics and its social manifestations change over time. Racism may manifest in the individual, but it is created, fostered and perpetuated by larger societal systems. This is how racism, when it exists in an individual, becomes institutionalized because we work within institutions, but how institutions therefore then reinforce the individual thought and patterns and behavior of people on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's look at socialization and racism and let's look at an alternate definition of racism. Racism then, another way of looking at this is that we have been socialized to participate in a complex network of social systems that are designed to benefit dominant groups, primarily by race in this country, in which marginalized groups continue to be oppressed as a result. The subjugation of minority groups is not accidental, occasional, or avoidable. This is the definition of racism that is more accurate because it changes with the times. If we are stuck on that binary example of racism, we are failing to understand that even racists themselves that wear the cloaks and the torches and the hoods, they're outdated. That's not the new face of racism in this country. Right? And we would be remiss to allow ourselves to only understand racism in that way. So here's what I'm gonna do. We're gonna examine, examine institutionalized racism and I'm gonna, we're gonna do two things in the next few slides. We're gonna take a 30,000 foot view of racism. So we're gonna step up above, beyond, right? Looking at the individual exchange of the elephant and the giraffe story, right? We're gonna take a step back and instead of looking only at the elephant and the giraffe, we're gonna step back and we're gonna look even farther from the neighborhood. We're gonna step back, we're gonna look even farther out of Riverside County. We're gonna step back, we're gonna look even farther out from California. We're gonna step back until we start to examine the larger social systems that exist in this country, just like a plane, right? Taking off from the ground. And then the other thing I'm gonna ask you to do as we move through these slides, I'm gonna ask you to reflect on some important considerations for yourself. I'm gonna ask you in essence to sort of look in the mirror, to take a self inventory, if you will, of where some of our own behaviors feed into these institutionalized practices of racism, okay? So that's where we're headed with this. Let's take this 30,000 foot level, right? This is a chart, a race chart that was developed in Nazi Germany. Uh, this is, uh, uh, taken during uh, pre-World War II, all right? And it's referred to as when Germany described the Nuremberg Laws, um, which were enacted in 1935. And what it did was Germany was very keen on in order to accomplish what Hitler um, uh, deemed as the final solution, right? The total extermination of the Jews. He had to claim superiority of German blood over that of Jewish descent. Jews in Europe 
are categorized more as a race than a religion. In European culture, um, Hitler, it wasn't outside the norm for Hitler to refer to um, uh, Jewish individuals or groups of Jewish people as a race. And so what happened was he set up laws and this chart is actually a blood lineage chart that shows if you are pure white, if you are Aryan, okay, you are pure and you are pure German and you can prove it because your parents, okay, came from this lineage. If you came mixed, okay, for, or you are 100% Jewish, then you fail to meet the criteria of of Aryan race in Germany, okay? So only people with four non-Jewish German grandparents, four white circles in the top left here were of German blood. A Jew in pre-World War II Germany, okay, was defined by Nazis as someone who descended from three or four Jewish grandparents, which are over here. Okay, these are considered Jewish individuals. Now in the middle here stood mixed blood, okay? Um, and in the middle that was mixed by first or second degree, all right, um, Jewish. So even it's important to understand is that if you were even mixed here, you were not considered pure or Aryan, you were still mixed, okay? Now you're thinking to yourself, Dr. Manko, why are you talking to me about racist World War II, Germany, old stuff, right? Well, it's important to understand this came at the decree of the Nazi government, okay? This was a policy that was set forth and said to be backed by science, right? That said, from now on, we're gonna treat Jews differently. We're gonna put a set of laws in place to treat this race differently. And we've proven, okay, according to, according to Hitler, we've proven, right, that this race exists, that there is an Aryan race and there's a mixed race and there is a Jewish race and the Aryan race trumps them all. And as a result of that, we're going to start treating ourselves like Aryans. We're going to start treating ourselves like we're full blood. And those of you who don't have the privilege of being Aryan race are going to be subjugated. In fact, I'm going to put laws in place that will prevent you, right, from ever mixing with this pure blood line, because this is our goal to preserve our blood, right? And so it was actually included in this list of Nuremberg laws in Nazi Germany that marriage Right, between mixed and pure was forbidden. Now let's step back. Remember, we're going to look into that mirror, that mirror that's sometimes hard to look at. We had our own laws set up for how we treated people in this country based on race. Now we had established that if you were from African descent, you were less than, right? And we refer to our set of laws different from the Nuremberg laws as the Jim Crow era or the Jim Crow laws, right? And they was founded Jim Crow era and the Supreme Court ruling of separate but equal in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. It was made public in 1830, the notion of Jim Crow, this term where Jim Crow came from, um, in 1830 when this popular actor, and this is a billfold of the original Jim Crow um, portrayal here, when this actor Thomas Dartmouth uh, Rice dressed in blackface and portrayed a clumsy, cognitively delayed black slave. And so this is the portrayal. This would actually be um, Thomas Rice, okay, the white individual painted in blackface and portraying black slaves as being delayed, clumsy, silly, things like this, okay? Then as a result of that, Jim Crow later became a widely used derogatory term to describe black men, but then you had other terminology. And again, do not use these terms, but I'm telling you how this language, this language of race applied in this country, words like Sambo or Zambo, uh, was also a highly derogatory term applied to Indian and African descent, sometimes expanded to uh, black women. And then this is where we were referring to men as boy, okay, because we didn't believe that a black man was indeed a man. They were less than and therefore referred to him as boy. Under Jim Crow laws, Jim Crow denied the black community the right to vote, which is what the March on Selma was all about in Alabama. Jim Crow justified murder without evidence or trial, right? And then they, what they said was if you broke a crime uh, in Jim Crow era, you could be sentenced to death by tree, right? And that resulted in the hanging, right, of individuals, black individuals. Um, by tree in the town and maintained a power differential of the poor white community and the blacks, okay, in the black community. So what's important to understand is the same way that we saw in Nazi Germany rules, right, established to subjugate individuals that were seen as less than in society, in this case, Jewish culture, this is where African-Americans were distinctively subjugated intentionally by systems. 
So let's look at some comparisons then of Nuremberg laws and Jim Crow. And their Nazi Germany, and this is just some, I think there was a total of like 300, 400, 400 or so laws that Nazi Germany enacted, right? Um, treating Jews differently based on race, right? And there were several, I mean, many more laws under Jim Crow um, as well. So let's look at this though. Some laws under Nuremberg, they're similar to Jim Crow. Marriage between Jews and non-Jewish Germans was banned. Under Jim Crow, interracial marriage was banned. Under Nuremberg laws in Nazi Germany, Jews could not walk on the sidewalk. Under Jim Crow, black citizens were required to step off the sidewalk when whites were using it. In Nazi Germany, Jews could not attend German public schools. In Jim Crow, black citizens could not attend white public schools. In Nazi Germany, Jews were not allowed to vote. Guess what? In Jim Crow, black citizens were not allowed to vote. Right? In Nazi Germany, public parks, entertainment centers, and areas were off limits to Jews. But guess what? In Jim Crow, public parks, entertainment centers, and areas were off limit, right? Um, sorry, to, to African Americans. Violation of these laws would be prison, hard labor, or death. And guess what? Violation of these laws would be prison, hard labor, or as I described earlier, death by tree. So it's important to note, to support this, this broader definition of racism, to move away from the binary approach of racism is to understand then that there is a spectrum considered of white supremacy. We often think of white supremacy as either just being up here, the genocide, the violence, right? Up here from probably calls for violence all the way up. And we often think and make the mistake in our country, well, we don't really do this discrimination stuff anymore, right? Like, well, I mean, the people that are in jail, they can't all be innocent, right? I mean, if you got pulled over, it was probably because you were doing something wrong. Well, you know what? I mean, our schools are filled with great teachers. How could they want children of color to be uh, represented in prisons at disproportionate rates, right? I, I don't fear people of color. I have black friends, right? Um, I, I would never, ever call someone a racial slur. And we start to move away from the definition of racism as we move down the spectrum and we stick to our definition up here in a binary approach. Let me just throw this out, folks. Racism doesn't get to be institutionalized without the indifference, the passivity of people that stood by and watched it happen. Nazi Germany, people, Hitler specifically, couldn't have murdered, systemically murdered 6.6 .6 million individuals if everyone in Germany stood up and fought against the Nazi party. If they said, we're not going to do that in this country, we won't stand for that murder, that racism in our country. No, Hitler was able to murder 6.6 .6 million Jews because good people, educated people, wealthy people stood by and said, this can all pass. This won't last forever. Well, I don't really know what's happening over there in the woods. And I hear gunshots sometimes, but it's probably just soldiers practicing. It can't be that they're shooting families, right, in the woods. And so good people allowed for a system of oppression to build, okay? So this is how institutional racism, right, builds uh, in a society. I wanna refer us into then a couple of ways. We looked at racism from a 30,000 foot level. Let's look at it very quickly from a notion of the mirror, right? I was gonna ask us to look in the mirror, no matter how uncomfortable that may feel, right? So that we can understand institutionalized racism and the power of it a little better, right? But let's, let's get some scripture going here, right? Let's take a minute and relax. Let's allow ourselves to remind ourselves that Christ is still present in this conversation. It's all good. We're gonna get through it, right? And so here's this one um, scripture verse from Joshua, which I'd like us to tune into. This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's just a reminder that Christ is with us in all conversations, even in this one. So I'd like us to examine something here. Some people like to say they're colorblind. Some people like to say, I don't see race. I see you for you, the person, right? And I said in marginalized pops, I said in week one, that's a problem. That's a problem for us. And I'm gonna demonstrate why. This is where we dive deeper, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So when we say race doesn't matter, really what that is, is an attempt to shirk the discomfort we feel when talking about race. Think about this for a second. Some of you have watched this lecture and already you're like, oh, 
I'm glad, right, that we're not doing this live and in person right now. And that's okay. Like I said, it's okay to recognize that in yourself. In fact, that's normal. But that's because when so many people say, well, I don't see race, what we're really saying, the subtitle to that is I, I don't want to see it because it makes it uncomfortable. Because maybe that means that I've done something, right, that needs to be talked about. And I'm not comfortable with that. Let me ask you this, if race doesn't matter, why is it so uncomfortable to talk about? We talk about things that don't matter all the time, right? We talk about getting haircuts, changing our hair color, mowing the grass, right? We talk about all these things to our family on a day to basis and no one says, hey, you know, when you walk in and you're like, I'm thinking about getting a haircut tomorrow, like, oh, oh, that's a little awkward. Uh, well, I don't know, do you wanna go there? Should we make some excuses, try to leave the room, right? No one does that. And so the fact of the matter is, is that oftentimes we avoid talking about race and we code our conversations around race to avoid talking about anything but race. Yet, we're still talking about race. Let me give you some examples, okay? Um, when we make statements like these, all right, it's problematic for us, all right? And if we are the oppressor in this case, it's problematic for us, but also for the oppressed. Let's look at some of these statements. I'm not racist, I have friends that are people of color. I'm not racist. I have, I have a black friend. Uh, my best friend's Latino, right? Whatever the case is. I'm not racist. My in-laws are people of color. I'm not racist. I lived overseas and was the minority for a time. I'm not racist. My niece, nephew is a person of color, right? I judge everyone by their actions, not their skin tone. I marched in the sixties. How can I be racist, right? I'm not racist. I live in a diverse neighborhood. I'm not racist. I love whatever food you want to insert from another culture, right? I love burritos. I love tacos, right? I love chicken. I love this. I love that. <clears throat> Excuse me. It doesn't matter to me if you are black, white, yellow, or polka dot, right? I see you for you. I don't see color. I see people, right? And then you'll hear that term, I am colorblind. Right? The problem with these statements, and I need you to hear this for a second. We've all used this. Okay, I'm just gonna say it. we've all used it. First off, we need to recognize that prejudice is not something that human beings are free of. We all carry prejudices. When we know about those prejudices, okay, then what happens is we call those explicit biases. When we don't know about them and they surface without knowing, we call those implicit biases, okay? When we make these statements, particularly around <coughs> people of color, the problem is that it takes race off the table for discussion. They negate the experiences of the oppressed and signal to them, you don't want to hear it. Okay. So here's the problem with that. If I'm a person of color, right. And I'm trying to talk to someone, a good friend of mine about how a statement they said hit home to me. Cause I, I know where their heart is, but it was a racist comment when they say, but Antonio, how can I be racist? Right. You're my best friend. I would say, look, so, so basically what you're saying is, is that just because we're friends, it makes you incapable of making a mistake or judge something about race. And because we're friends, I'm no longer allowed to talk about it. I'm no longer allowed to share my opinion because we're friends and that's it. So if I feel something is racist, it's wrong. So it negates it, it takes it off the table. And you have to understand then that people of color, remember in our first lecture, the red and the blue pill have been living with the red pill for a very long period of time. And now you're telling their entire lives, their generations before them. And now you're telling them that their experience isn't relevant. It isn't valid. Right? We also, in addition to saying things that take race off the table, behave in racially conscious manners. We actually act differently that tell us that we are uncomfortable dealing with matters of race. This is when we act overly nice to someone that's a different race as us, right? We Sometimes we avoid um, contact, crossing the street, not going to a particular bar, club, or restaurant. We may mimic Black mannerisms and speech, and we may do this in a way um, to either try to be funny as a joke, or we may be even doing it in a way to complain and sort of say without saying what a person looked like by giving mannerisms and speech. We may be being careful not to use racial terms or labels around folks. So trying to avoid saying Latino, trying to avoid saying black, trying to avoid saying African-American, okay? Using coding words to negatively talk about people of color, 
So I'm not saying that that neighborhood is Latino. I'm just saying it's a rough neighborhood. I'm not saying that that school is primarily composed of Latinos and African-Americans. I'm just saying it's a poor school. I'm not saying that I have a problem with the high school being called Martin Luther King High School in the rich suburbs of an area. I'm just saying I'd like to change the name to a different name. And this has actually happened, folks, in our society. I'm not going to say where exactly, but you could probably do the research on that. Where members in a community, in a wealthy, affluent community, wanted to change the name of a high school not, and, and change it away from Martin Luther King Junior High School because they did not want the name of the high school attributed to urban schools, urban schools, low performing schools. What are urban low performing schools primarily composed of? People of color, right? This is a way of coding, of talking about race without talking about race. Occasional violence directed at people of color. Occasional violence, not always meaning the, the awful image, right? Of someone hanging from a tree, but calling someone names yelling them out of Starbucks to speak English, right? Um, flying off the handle and suddenly the N word slips out when you're yelling at someone who appears to be black or African American. These are those microaggressions, those words that are used, all right, that are racially conscious, even though we don't want to acknowledge that they are. Right? <clears throat> so here's what I want to do. We're gonna move away from that topic and we're gonna talk about then, as some of you saw, you watched 13th, right, in, in class. And then we're gonna be talking about the institutionalization of racism in relation to incarceration in this country, right? And so we're gonna be talking about that um, now. So I wanna talk about just how we got there for a second and where this came from, right? Um, Many of you understood that then the 13th Amendment was neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, uh, except as a punishment for crime whereof a party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. This is the 13th Amendment, right? The 13th Amendment abolished, abolished slavery, right? Yet at the same time, the concern that we have was though a loophole was described that if you committed a crime, then you can be locked up, then you can do hard labor, right? And so this came from this notion that following the Civil War, um, wealthy white individuals now that had run plantations and businesses in the South that were primarily run um, essentially through slave labor, completely through slave labor, uh, the labor force was now gone because the slaves had been emancipated. And the South in particular had been absolutely devastated by war. In some cases, as portrayed in this old uh, painting here, entire cities were burned and fathers and sons were dead, okay? Lincoln had to make a very difficult decision during the Civil War. He was trying to preserve not destroying any of the South because he represented, he knows that it represented our own country. We were still brothers and sisters as a country. He didn't want to do that. But as the South continued to fight and resist, at one point, he had given commands to his officers to begin to burn down the South. And as a result of that, you had Southerners with no money, no industry, no labor, nothing left, right? So Southern white aristocrats sought to uphold their social status and power amongst all of this chaos. How do we stay in power? How do we stay on top? And there was a fear behind this too. Yo, I'm looking over and there are a lot of emancipated slaves, right? That aren't too happy with me, right? As a result of how the last 200 years have gone, right? And so I need to figure out a way to stay on top for my own safety is what they're thinking. So the 13th Amendment was released January 31st of 1865 and was used as a tool at that point to incarcerate or kill black individuals right, with little or no evidence. Jim Crow laws then obviously were founded on and built on this notion of law and order. There will be law and order. So look, you may be free, but I don't like that threatening look that you gave my cousin over there. And as a result, we're gonna take matters into our own hands, right? No jury right? No judge, just me, right? And this is where this notion, this practice came from, right? So it's important to understand, though, that how that's one sentiment, right, of thought, it became institutionalized. 
media has a large impact on how we institutionalize images, racism, discrimination in our head. A real classic example of that comes from the film Birth of a Nation that was released in 1915, okay? Now, what's important to understand is this was America's first box office hit. This was our first hit as a country and it was based on a racist portrayal of African Americans and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the South. All right, the longest film uh, released in its day was, was this one, The Birth of a Nation, and it was viewed by over 3 million people. And in 1915, in February, after President Woodrow Wilson uh, watched it, he reportedly remarked, it's like writing history with lightning, my only regret. It is, it is all so terribly true. Folks, when you read this comment, don't read it as, oh, my only regret, as in it's bad, that racism is bad. He was reading it as, I'm just so sad that the portrayal, the representation of uh, African Americans in this film is so true. That is a problem, a problem for several reasons. And I want to show you the film really quick so you understand <clears throat> what Woodrow Wilson was talking about. So in this film, there is a classic scene that is shown um, of a white woman uh, in the deep south that leaves her home and she is stalked by an African-American liberated, um, emancipated Civil War soldier and then violence ensues, okay? This was the first image for many Americans. Remember, box office hit here, three million people watching it of how African-Americans are portrayed in our country. And this, this fear um, perpetuated across generations and exists to this day, where individuals see African-American individuals in a certain light as a direct result of images associated not only with this film, but many other images throughout pop culture in our country. And so I wanna show you this. It's also important to note that the actor that appears African-American in this film is played as a white actor in blackface, okay? And so I wanna just show you this. We're only gonna watch a small segment of it and watch this because it's important to understand the root of where um, this notion institutionalization of racism comes from and then we'll analyze this clip. So let me stop really quick and let me bring up our clip right here. All right, let's check this out. And there's no um, dialogue because it's 1915. So let's just watch the images that take place here.
Okay, we'll end there. So this film, as described by President uh, Woodrow Wilson, right? Uh, again, <clears throat> to reemphasize the point, it's like writing lightning, history with lightning. My only regret is that it's all so terribly true. Several problematic ways that racism was institutionalized as a result, right, of the portrayal of African Americans in this film that perpetuated over generations that led to some of those racialized behaviors that I was describing previously in this, in this lesson as a result of that. So here, according to this film, African Americans were portrayed as jobless, sexual predators, incapable of controlling their sexual urges or physical urges, chasing after right, this white woman through the forest, <clears throat> uh, a group to be feared, right? And let me also emphasize this point that it was the, the uh, white male, all right, that was in this scene, it was up to him to pursue the African-American male to protect his daughter, presumably, or whoever that was, right, away from um, African-American individuals. And so, and so according to this film, it reaffirmed the belief that a group, um, the African-American community needed to be separated from white citizens in all social and legal senses, including voting, right? In order to protect um, um, white individuals. And reference to the Black Union soldier was a stab at the Northern integration efforts to integrate uh, the, the army, um, the military in the North with African-American soldiers. And so that was that little jab uh, that the director took. And so you can see how then through images, through culture, that the notion of racism not only lies inherently with the individual, but becomes institutionalized because this becomes common thought, practice, understanding of dominant groups. It leads to then segregation, it leads to laws, it leads to anti-voting, it leads to murder, right? And let me explain this to you then really quickly then. Um, there were voices that stood out, right, that spoke for those who were oppressed, um, particularly in powerful ways, right? When we talk about institutionalized racism, we also talk about individuals that are dedicated to dismantling it and trying to bring awareness um, to the awful, horrendous acts that take place as a result of things like institutionalized racism. Um, Strange Fruit, some of you may have heard the poem and the song. Um, now, now, it's important to note that this song is very powerful because it addresses specifically um, the number of lynchings or death by tree as described in the South, right? Uh, that occurred between the years of 1882 and 1951. Between those periods of time, 3,438 African-American or black individuals were lynched um, as a direct result of Jim Crow era, racial institutionalized racism. Um, what we may not know is that the poem, Strange Fruit, the song was actually written by a teacher, Abel Mirpool, um, as a poem in 1937. And actually when he, when Abel wrote the poem, it was actually banned from the newspaper because it was considered too risque, too powerful um, to be able to share in common media. Yet we were able to portray a birth of a nation, right, in common media during, you know, just, just what, um, 25 years almost later. Um, the song was most famously performed by Billie Holiday, who first recorded the song, uh, sang it in 1939. Now, something that's interesting that you may not know about the song and about Billie Holiday, Billie Holiday actually didn't like um, performing this song. She didn't, it, was, it wasn't something she enjoyed doing, going on stage and singing Strange Fruit. Um, in fact, Billie Holiday had stated on several occasions that before going up and singing the song, she would become sick to her stomach. And when people asked her, why do you keep singing the song when it's so painful to hear, when it's so painful to listen to the lyrics because it's so powerful? She says, I have to sing this song and please excuse my language in here, but this is what reportedly what Billie Holiday said. I need to sing this song because when I do, it's like rubbing their shit in it, my, their nose in their own shit is what she said. And what she meant by that was, is that when she um, played, when she sang this song, 
and she heard that those in particular that were white were attending her conference, I mean, her, her conference, her performance, then what would happen was it was a reminder, a, dec a, a, a direct reminder of the institutionalized oppression and the individual suffering that took place as a result of racism in this country. I would like to, if I may, play the song. It's very short of Strange Fruit. Now, normally I would accompany this, um, but I'm not going to do it today uh, because I would really prefer to be with you all in person if we did this. But um, I would um, also share with you some of the graphic images of the lynchings that took place. Um, there are photographs of lynchings that took place in the Deep South, not for, for factor of just shock factor but to understand that the imagery and the lyrics described in this song are very powerful and very disturbing. Um, I wanted to also demonstrate to you because in several of those photographs, what you see are, are African-Americans being lynched. And what you will see is a mob of people standing around watching, laughing. To be honest with you, some are even having a picnic around the body. There were jokes about lynching that occurred, calling it a Southern barbecue, very graphic, I know. And at times, individuals took pictures of the lynchings that occurred and put them on postcards. And they sent postcards to their relatives uh, bragging about the lynchings that they witnessed in the Deep South, that they were excited to be there. This is why I wanted to show you these images, why Billie Holiday felt sick to her stomach singing this song and why the lyrics in particular are so powerful. But for the sake of today, I'm gonna to play the lyrics for you. We'll watch the lyrics on the screen and then we'll move on so you can appreciate the power, right? Uh, the real power and pain that's caused by institutionalized racism. These acts of racism are not only being perpetuated by individuals who are doing the lynching, but you have to understand that this was legally justified in our government as a result of institutionalized racism taking place in our country. This was policy. Okay. So let's go ahead and listen to this song, Strange Fruit. Uh, this one is performed by Billie Holiday. twisted mouth set a magnolia sweet and fresh then the sudden smell of burning flesh here
Okay, so I know that that can be <clears throat> really powerful, really tough to watch, right? Um, and I think it's important to understand then that uh, some people wanna tell us that institutional racism is over, that because we eliminated Jim Crow laws in our country, that this kind of stuff doesn't happen anymore. Um, I, unfortunately, I think that they're, they're on the blue pill status. Right? They're not taking the red pill. They're not understanding the truth of what's existing in our country and currently happening. Um, <clears throat> and so W.E. Du Bois had said, Du Bois had said, uh, the slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun and then moved back again towards slavery, referring to the institutional racism of Jim Crow that occurred following the emancipation of the slaves. Right, so emancipation of slaves takes place following the Civil War. Then individuals think that we can now move forward from this. We can start to have a better life. We can start to not fear for ourselves. We have our, our own path that we can carve in life. And then suddenly Jim Crow comes around, institutionalized racism policy that exists in our country that allowed this. And suddenly, right, uh, individuals moving then back again towards slavery. It's important to understand then that when we examine institutionalized racism, sometimes we're looking at it from two different lenses, if you will, right? The lens of the movie and the lens of the snapshot. The lens of the movie is continuous, right? When we watch a movie, it's a set of frames that all play together that add up to one long story. And then, as you know, you take a snapshot of a film and what happens when you take a snapshot, it's one still picture of one moment in time and that's the end of it. That's the beginning, that's the end. It's just that photo. What's important to understand then is, and I had mentioned something in the last slide that some individuals will say, well, that happened so long ago, right? Well, that, that was way back in the 1800s. How can that possibly directly impact anything we do now? That's not happening anymore. I would encourage folks to understand that those moments, those words really lend to a snapshot and not the movie. The movie is the experience of African-Americans, of people of color in this country being treated differently day after day, moment after moment, interaction after interaction, conversation after conversation in this country, right? Um, the snapshot is what we only see proven as an example of that in the moment. Let me give you an example. Following the murder of George Floyd, individuals were outraged, right? And rightfully so. Some individuals were outraged and they said, they were outraged because they said, this is so awful. I can't believe that this happened. Look at what is on the media. It had been a long time since someone in the media had actually seen, we'd actually seen someone killed like this, all right, at the hands of law enforcement. And so what happened was people were saying, this is outrageous. I can't believe this happened. They had this strong emotional reaction. So we have to do something about it. We have to demonstrate we can't stand for this anymore. Good, fine. But also consider, though, that for some individuals, that was a reaction to a snapshot, not the movie. See, if you asked other individuals, people of color, particularly African-American or Black in this country, they would have said, why, why was it, and they're not saying this in an accusatory sense, but why was it this incident was so disturbing for you to see, right? Why was it that this one incident led to this spillover when we have been saying this for centuries, we have been saying this for decades, we've been saying this for years, this has been our movie, not just our snapshot, okay? Then you had other people looking at this snapshot of what happened with George Floyd, and they're saying, how awful is it that the demonstrations are happening? How awful is it that this rioting is happening? How awful is it that this collision, this, this um, conflict that's occurring within our society is happening? This is so bad, I don't understand why it's happening. That's because the understanding was based off of a snapshot and not a movie, okay? So what I would like to do is play for you one more film and I want to explain to you then the movie, right? The experience of people of color, but also in, in more specifically, the experience of many African-Americans or black individuals um, that have had experiences based on the institutionalization of racism, not just singular incidents, one on one, that one time, you know, one individual named George Floyd passed in this country. No, a movie, right, representing decades of this occurring. 
centuries if you really go back to Jim Crow, right? So the next clip I'm gonna pay, play for you is powerful. I'm not gonna lie, it can be disturbing. Uh, if you need to take a break after watching this clip and then come back, that's fine. Uh, but I'm gonna continue on with the lecture as we move through. This is the movie, right, of experiences um, outside of George Floyd's death that many individuals have lived with their entire lives and their parents have lived with. So proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the rest. Okay, so like I said before, difficult, right, to watch. Um, the red pill is sometimes very difficult. Um, I'd like to read a few names uh, as we move through the next few slides to kind of reiterate for you that this is a movie, right, not a snapshot that we're dealing with with institutional racism. I gave you some examples um, earlier that racism, the definition of it continues to change. And so does what racism looks like in a society. Racism doesn't look the same today as it did in the 1950s and 60s, or even in the 1800s, right? And so in order to honor the movie, right, of individuals who have fallen, right, uh, the main voiceless now at the hands of institutional racism in our country, I'd like to read a few uh, names and phrases right here, right? I can't breathe, Eric Gardner, uh, 43. I don't have a gun, stop shooting me, Michael Brown. Mom, I'm going to college, Amadou Diallo. I love you too, Sean Bell. You shot me, you shot me, Oscar Grant. Officers, why do you have your guns out? Kenneth Chamberlain. Why did you shoot me? Kendrick McDade. What are you following me for? Trayvon Martin. Uh, then we've got uh, Richard Brooks, 27. Daniel Prude, 41. Breonna Taylor, 26. Atatiana Jefferson, 28. Aurora Rosser, 40. Stephen Clark, 22. Botham Jean, 26. Philando Castile, 32. Alton Sterling, 37. Michelle Cusso, 50. Sorry. Freddie Gray, 25. Tanisha Fonville, 20. And I can't breathe, George Floyd. Finally, we end with a quote uh, from MLK. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that really matter. 
right? So <clears throat> we all know that King was later assassinated on April 4th, 1968, right? So first off, let me acknowledge this, right? Um, when I do these lessons, just because I teach in um, social work or we talk about inclusion, diversity, and I do a lot of trainings on this topic, doesn't mean that it gets any easier, right? Remember I told you that even talking about racism, institutional racism, discrimination, prejudice can be difficult, right? I mean that generally, as you can see, even though I've been doing these trainings for a long period of time, it doesn't mean that it doesn't uh, take a toll on you, right? So when I say that there's a snapshot in the movie that's playing out in our country, it's important to understand that when we see reactions to people attempting to understand why there was so much outrage with George Floyd's death, um, why there were demonstrations going on, it's important to understand that for many folks, this had been a movie. This wasn't just about George Floyd, right? This was about the countless names of individuals that had passed at the hands of institutional racism in this country, right? So again, my apologies. What I'm gonna do is I know this lesson has run a little long. We're almost at the end of it. And so thank you for sticking with me through this. What I would like to do is I would like to take just 30 seconds of silence to honor the individuals who have passed at the hands of institutional racism, not only individuals whose names I've read on the screen, but the names of many of those individuals who were never covered in the news, as well as the individuals who passed at the hands of death by tree, right, in this country um, as a result of racism uh, becoming policy, right, in this country. So I'd like to take 30 seconds. Let's just close our eyes and honor those individuals and we'll come back to the lesson. All right, thank you so much. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about then was in reference to institutional racism, what we had were individuals in the summer of unrest defined as the summer of 2020, right? This past summer that, that had just has just passed, um, that many individuals stood up, right, in a voice. Now, here's what was amazing and hopeful about the summer of unrest. Never before had we seen in this country the diversity of opposition against institutionalized racism um, that existed uh, up until these marches, right? You saw here a combination of individuals of different ages, races, genders, right? Um, sexual orientation, right? All of this coming forward and saying, all these people coming forward and saying, we can't stand for this anymore. Now, what happened though, is that as the protests and demonstrations began to take place, and this we're heading towards the tail end of the lesson, folks. So thank you for heading there with me, okay? Um, is that what we saw was, is that you saw banners like this, right? In, in marches such as this saying Black Lives Matter. And what you saw was this sort of increase. Now these have been present, these, these images here that you see on the screen, these images have been present long before the killing of George Floyd. Um, but you saw them come forward more into the limelight um, following the summer, that during the summer of unrest this summer 2020. So what you saw were images like All Lives Matter, and you saw Red Lives Matter and a lot of Blue Lives Matter in this discussion. And remember we we're talking about the snapshot in the movie? So here's what I would say, right? Many times individuals would come to me and ask me, Dr. Mako, why is it, what does Black Lives Matter mean because there's people coming and saying that Black Lives Matter BLM is a militant movement, that it's a movement of anger or retribution. And what I would respond to them as saying is that that is probably based off an understanding that's a snapshot of BLM and not the movie, okay? Um, if you notice, one of the names that I read on the screen was Trayvon Martin, right? And his quote was, why are you following me on there? Um, and I think that what we, fail to understand when we're advocating for all lives matter, uh, for blue lives matter or red lives matter is we're, we're basing that opinion off of a snapshot rather than the movie. 
So here's what I ask people to consider, right? People have come to me and said, well, Dr. Mako, I really think it's all lives matter. And I say, well, I get where you're going at with that. I get what you're trying to describe when you're saying all lives matter, that you want everyone to be treated the same. I say, but I'm going to ask if you're willing, right, to take the red pill for a second. The fact of the matter is not everyone has been treated the same in this country. The fact of the matter is, is when we say all lives matter, it's tone deaf to the fact that there have been centuries of institutionalized racism that have led to the death of African-American individuals and people of color in this country purely as a result of their skin tone. And so I said, do you know the origin of the Black Lives Matter movement? And many of them say, no, I don't know where it came from. Now then individuals will say to me, but Dr. Mayko, shouldn't blue lives matter? Shouldn't red lives matter? And I, I, this is where I would commonly say to them, and again, not in anger, but to say, can I just uh, delineate some distinctions for you? There's no such thing as a blue life or a red life. Those are occupations. Those are jobs. Those are jobs that we need and we honor, right? We honor the jobs of our law enforcement. I want them in my community. I appreciate the work they do. I recognize that it's not easy. Right, but that is their job, that's not the person. When someone says Black Lives Matter, it means me, okay, me, the person, not what I do. No one's running around there and saying, well, you know, realtors' lives matter, you know. Um, you know, no one's running around and saying, well, you know, I mean, restauranters matter, waiters matter. No, we're not talking about occupations, we're talking about human beings, okay. So what I'd like to do very briefly is describe the origin of the Black Lives Matter movement. It's important to understand because this is a movement that is in opposition, right, to um, um, institutionalized racism. And that's what they're discussing. And so what I'd like to do is talk about that. Now, the Black Lives Matter movement really comes down to um, surfacing as a result of the murder of Trayvon Martin, okay? So many of you are already familiar, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but on February 26, 2012, Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman, um, the shooter, were engaged in a physical altercation resulting in Martin being shot once in the chest and later died. Florida stand your ground laws applied. Now, we're gonna examine Florida stand your ground laws very quickly following this, but I wanna just share um, um, one thing about that, right? And for the sake of time, um, I won't play the phone calls for you, but normally I would play the sounds so that you can hear the original phone call by George Zimmerman, the 911 call that was placed by a neighbor who heard the altercation taking place, and then finally the acquittal. But what's important to understand is on July 13th, 2013, Zimmerman, the shooter, was acquitted of all charges, including second degree murder and manslaughter. So none of that stuck in the case, the killing of Trayvon Martin. Now that evening when George uh, Zimmerman was uh, acquitted, Alicia Garza, who is a black activist and writer, posted a discussion called A Love Note to Black People, okay? And in there, um, she in her post, she put black people, I love you, I love us, our lives matter. And as a result of that, one of her friends who was a fellow activist responded with declaration, black bodies will no longer be sacrificed for the rest of the world's enlightenment I am done, I am so done. Trayvon, you are loved infinitely. And then um, her friend used the, the hashtag Black Lives Matter. So the Black Lives Matter movement exists due to the cascade of killings, right? The names that I read to you in addition to so many more that were not listed, right? Um, as a result of institutionalized racism. Um, what's important to understand is Black Lives Matter does not mean that only Black Lives Matter or that Black Lives Matter more than any other race. It's simply saying that Black Lives Matter too, that we matter too, okay? Um, so when we understand that distinction, it becomes a little easier for us to understand the perspective of others. Again, Black Lives Matter is the response to a movie, not a snapshot. Right. Trayvon Martin was not the reason Black Lives Matter occurred solely in itself, but it was the tipping point where people were saying, I can't go on doing this anymore, right? Something has to change. Our lives matter too, okay? So really quickly, stand your ground law. Some of you were like, what is that? There was a lot of that on the news, all this kind of stuff. So what's important to understand is stand your ground law um, in Florida shapes self-defense laws throughout the state of Florida, okay? Now, really quick, briefly, I'm not gonna go into a lot of this, but this is the problem, right? The problem is when I see this, the Black Lives Matter movement struggling in terms of trying to gain ground, um, 
in response to changing legislation. Here's one of the legislation that still exists to this day that bothers me that it's still there, but we need to talk about. And stand your ground law, it is legally, all right, legally, a person who is in a dwelling or residence in which the person has a right to be has no duty to retreat and has the right to stand his or her ground and use uh, or threaten to use deadly force, okay, um, if they're in danger of being harmed. Okay, so what's important to understand is here is that this law basically says you don't need to retreat. If you're in a situation in which you feel your life is in jeopardy, you can use deadly force in that incident. So, so many people ask the question afterwards, how was it that George Zimmerman was acquitted of all charges, including manslaughter, even when he pursued Trayvon Martin and 911 specifically said, we do not need you to follow him. How could he do that? Well, according to the law that is written in your stand your ground law, he was 100% in the law's writing here um, to engage and use deadly force based on how the law is written. So this is what I'm talking about folks when I talk about macro social work and breaking down institutionalized racism. It's not enough for a company to say we want to sell soda for you and thanks for buying our soda and not giving money to dismantle oppressive systems that work within this. It's not enough for us to say, oh, that's so sad what happened to Trayvon Martin. This can never happen again and not actively work to change the laws to dismantle other opportunities for this to happen to another individual, right? This is the distinction of macro social work. So let me go ahead and I know that it's been a long lesson and thank you for sticking with me. What I'm gonna do is I wanna just uh, close out with a couple more slides. And so I'm setting this up here, um, just checking out uh, where we wanna go with the last remaining slides for today. Let's talk about then um, what justice looks like, yeah, and where we're headed for today's lesson. So. Let me get rid of this. And I'm sorry for the, uh, uh, the delay here, folks. It's just, I wanna go ahead and close out the lesson today. I know it's been a long, powerful lesson and I apologize for all of the uh, uh, technical issues with today's lesson. For some reason, the computer was fighting me a little bit, um, but let's go ahead and do this, right? Let's go ahead and, and touch on this here. So I'd like to close this out with some scripture, right? Um, just because uh, when I know in centering that Christ is present with us in every moment, right? Christ doesn't promise us that our discussions will be easy. Christ doesn't promise us that these lessons will be, the red pill is easy to swallow, right? But he does promise us he'll be with us through it all to give us strength and clarity to go on. He'll give us the courage to talk about these issues, even when they're difficult, right? Um, and so some people ask me then, Dr. Mexico, what you're talking about when you're battling institutionalized racism is creating a more just society. And I said, that's correct. And they said, you know, what is justice? What is the marrow of justice in your understanding of it? And in those cases, I would point them to scripture. I'm only going to share two more slides with you and then we'll close out with our centering for today. Okay. Um, for me, what justice means is what Jesus spoke of when he talked about the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter five, right? And in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the persecuted for the sake of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward will be great in heaven. Thus, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So for me, the marrow of justice based on biblical uh, lessons comes from the notion that we are to call by Christ to humble ourselves, right? Um, and rather than lift ourselves up, right? That the poor the meek, those who, who, who are persecuted, uh, you know, those who are merciful and clean of heart, those are the ones to be lifted up in our society. Uh, the peacemaking should be our way, not through militant power, um, that we should, that those who are persecuted need a voice, right? And, and if you are falsely accused, 
um, that there will be righteousness for you at some point, justice, right? So in Matthew chapter five, in the Beatitudes, the poor, the brokenhearted, the submissive, the meek, the oppressed, the clean of heart, we're supposed to uplift them. Sounds familiar, right? Like social work. You reap what you sow, right? Mercy will be extended to the merciful. Peacemakers will be called God's children. Ergo, the love of a parent shall be extended to God's children. He has thrown down the rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the lowly. This is a reference to Luke, where Mary sings the Magnificent or the Canticle or the Magnificat or the Canticle of Mary, right? She talks about Jesus coming to us to throw down the rulers from their thrones and lift up the lowly. Right? Justice is not about exchanging one oppressive group for the other or swapping subjugation. Justice is a journey towards shalom rather than a destination. And we have a responsibility right, as Christians, as social workers, as human beings, as children of God to disrupt and dismantle oppressive systems and challenge discrimination, as well as to seek reconciliation, restitution, and restoration for others. Right? So um, I want to Thank you so much for tuning in, right? Again, a little difficult, I know, but also know that not all of our lectures will be this heavy, right? But we have to be able to talk about these issues in a real way in order to truly appreciate the power um, behind macro social work and what we're attempting to dismantle. People talk about institutionalized racism and it's so bad, but rarely do we talk about the Breonna Taylors, the Trayvon Martins, right? The George Floyds, all of those we only talk about the structure, but the structure impacts people. And so when we're social workers striving to dismantle uh, institutionalized racism, that's what we're attempting to break that cycle, okay? So um, let's cue in for our centering verse for today, coming from Isaiah, I'm just queuing up my timer here, from Isaiah um, chapter 41. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And our word today will be courageous. Folks, I want to commend you for being courageous today in attending the lecture. I want to thank you for continuing to be courageous about having these conversations around the table and with your family and with your friends and with your colleagues. I know they are not easy, but also remember Christ is with us in every moment. So let's go ahead and make sure our hands and feet are in a nice comfortable position. Let's go ahead and take that weight, right? That we're carrying some of that sadness maybe that you're feeling, some of that frustration or anger maybe even that you're feeling as a result of, of all of this, knowing that all of this happens out there, right? And let's give that to God. And let's, as Mother Teresa says, allow Christ to enter our hearts for a moment. Kneel down and pray in the center of our heart on this term courageous right? And I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand that God will be there to lift us up, right? When we are feeling these moments of heaviness, right? Take a nice deep breath, close your eyes, and I will keep track of the time.
Okay, go ahead and open your eyes, take a nice deep breath. Welcome back. Folks, I want to say thank you so much for joining the lesson. I'm going to be logging off for today, but I want to encourage you, let you all know, keep pushing forward with the content. If you have questions about the course, your assignments, um, just let me know. Please be sure to check Blackboard for any of your upcoming assignments. Helpful to hop on right after this lecture and do that. And of course, I'm here if you need anything. Thank you all so much. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Have a great day. Talk to you all soon. Thank you.